Uh, hello, everyone. A quick introduction for myself and Otters before we get to our incredible speaker today. I'm Susanna Pallets, an associate professor at UMD's um, College of Information Studies, and the, I am uh, actually the director of Otters, but um, a little quick information about Otters stands for Organizational Teams and Technology Research Society, and we're a network of scholars across the D.C. area and increasingly beyond. We're dedicated to researching, learning anything and everything regarding teams and technology. It is my pleasure to introduce the speaker today. Uh, this is Josh Strauss, is actually the speaker uh, coordinator for this year's um, the, this year's Otters speaker series. So he's uh, an Otters member. We try to have an Otters member every uh, semester give a talk. Uh, he's a doctoral candidate at the Social Decision and Organizational Science Program at University of Maryland Psychology Department. He's also a DEI consultant at CIDIS LLC, which maybe is pronounced CIDIS, I'm not sure. He has an MS from his same program and also has a bachelor's degree from the University of California, Davis in psychology, communication, organizational sociology, and linguistics. His research employs multi-level process-oriented theory and methods, primarily related to diversity and team science. Both his work and practice converge on advancing Josh's larger goal of empowering people to come together in compassion and cooperation. And um, with that, please hold your questions to the end, or rather you can ask questions when they come up, but we won't answer them until the end. And thank you very much. And thank you for speaking, Josh. Yeah, thank you, um, Susanna, for that introduction. Thank you everyone um, for uh, coming today. Uh, I'm really excited to talk to um, this group uh, in particular uh, about something I've been working on uh, for a very long time now. Uh, which is developing uh, a video game to study uh, team phenomena um, and uh, a lot uh, across a lot of different topics. Uh, and so there's some potential for uh, studying human AI teaming, um, which we've talked a lot about in Otters. I know it's a lot uh, an important topic to a lot of people uh, here. Um, and so I want to sort of give an overview of the game. Um, tell you what we've done with it so far and the possibilities out there. Um, so I am not the first person uh, to use video games in uh, research, including Teams research. Uh, I was actually uh, partially inspired by this study by Ellis et al. Uh, from 2005, where they looked at how team training impacts team processes like coordination and communication. Um, by using uh, this very simple game um, where each player controls uh, a few vehicles within one of these quadrants here. Uh, so they can only move and uh, within the quadrant and they can only see within these uh, circles. And so in this game, uh, there would be some enemy tracks moving along a path uh, within um, uh, and between these quadrants. And so people would have to move to either intercept or to view, uh, and then let the other person in another quadrant know that the enemy is coming towards them so that they can make sure to stop the enemy or track it. Um, more recently in uh, 2019, Julian Clement uh, wrote a paper um, where he looked at sense making, uh, collective sense making's impact on adaptation uh, using data from uh, the online video game Dota. Um, I like to say he got Dota data. Uh, it's very um, cool that he was able to do this, to work with the developer, uh, to actually go into the uh, log files, the log data that uh, the company collects, uh, and analyze some of the research questions that way. Um, but so this first study uh, by LSL, um, that was a pretty simple uh, task that was really targeted towards making um, very clear operational measures of these things that they're looking at. Um, and so the data they got was very targeted. Um, whereas uh, this other uh, study that used Dota, the game is more complex, maybe has more aspects of um, real life teams um, processes. Uh, in fact, these uh, Dota and other similar games uh, are actually played like sports at the national level. Uh, this is a five versus five game. Um, but um, we're not here to talk about other people's great accomplishments. 
um, I want to start talking about where um, the game I'm about to introduce came from. Uh, so I uh, was planning my uh, thesis, and with my advisor being James Grand, uh, I was uh, made aware very early on that teams are very complex uh, uh, behavioral patterns unfold over time. And so there's a need for a very rich um, uh, data. Uh, and so I wanted to do something like one of these studies. Uh, so I actually used the same software um, Ellis et al. used, uh, which was uh, DDD, standing for Dynamic Distributed Decision Making. Uh, it's actually a uh, software built by Aptma back in 2000, or, sorry, 1992. Um, so this had everything that I needed to program a game. Um, this is someone else's game. This is not mine. Uh, this is someone's game world uh, with some annotations, but the uh, interface is the same, same one that I used. Um, but I began uh, making it my own. And what you see here is a the map that I used. Um, a shout out to uh, my brother, who I'll thank in the acknowledgments again for um, his graphic design uh, prowess. And he also has some background in video games. Um, so he gave me this uh, very pretty map uh, that I started building my team game in. I was doing my thesis in uh, 2019, and um, uh, DDD, while being very old, is actually still a very powerful uh, tool, except that it only works on local networks. Uh, it cannot be administered over the internet, so COVID happened. I studied teams. I was planning to bring people into the uh, our lab where they'd each be at a computer and play this game. Couldn't do that with new restrictions. So that was a no-go. Uh, but I really wanted to do this um, uh, for the data as well as uh, I just grew up playing video games. Um, and I saw an opportunity to make research fun for participants as well as getting this rich data. So my next step was to try and redo this in Game Maker. Um, I also know of Game Maker from uh, my brother who uh, took some game design classes in uh, his undergrad uh, at University of California, Santa Cruz. Uh, and Game Maker is a very popular um, platform uh, software for uh, novice game designers. Uh, and so I started teaching myself uh, Game Maker language. There's also a drag and drop interface that made things uh, easier as well. Uh, but when it came to the networking component, I was out of my depth. Um, so I hired a freelancer and we we're back to the races. I uh, We started the game uh, was uh, built up um, and the net it was ready to be um, put online. Uh, but then there were some issues with getting the online um, uh, the web sockets to work, um, we had to, we could only do it by downloading a client or each participant would have to download an application, um, which would be, you know, only run on Windows or Mac. Um, if they didn't have enough space or they're using a Chromebook or something, we could have run into a lot of problems. Uh, so we decided to scrap this idea too. Um, but that is when I met the man who saved my life and my, um, uh, uh, academic career. Uh, Marcin uh, is a developer that I've been working with uh, to design what I'm about to present to you all, which is Birdwatch, uh, which is a, an online multiplayer cooperative game uh, which generates log data. Um, and I'll go more into the advantages of this game and specifically what people are doing, which is a quick orientation. Uh, what you're looking at here is uh, two out of three players' screens um, just juxtaposed right next to each other. These were actually uh, my cousins helping me to test this game when we first got it um, going. Uh, they each recorded their gameplay and uh, I had an RA put it together. So you could see this is them playing in real time together um, in this game world. Uh, so what I plan to talk about today, sort of three broad parts, uh, an overview of the game, uh, how uh, you play it, why it looks the way it does, 
then I'm going to go over the two uh, research studies that we're currently collecting data for um, using this game uh, as sort of a primer on how this uh, can be used. And then I want to finish out talking about some future directions, uh, some uh, features of the game that are actually already built in that we're just not using for the studies that we're currently running. Uh, and of course, this is when I'll bring in uh, how we can bring in AI uh, human teaming. So um, three parts of the overview, um, uh, how it, this game elicits team behavior um, and how we measure that behavior as well as team outcomes. And I called that this last part recruiting, um, maybe sampling is a better term, um, ways that it makes participation really easy and helps um, collect more participants. Uh, so starting with the uh, team behaviors, how this game forces people to act as a team so we can learn about teams. Um, before I get exactly into that, I do want to sort of just broad strokes uh, how this game is played. Uh, so the goal of the game, uh, there's at least one goal, uh, which is to make as much money as possible. Pretty straightforward. Um, there are, um, sorry about that, jumping ahead. Um, there are two sort of ways to uh, get money. The first is by taking pictures of birds. Um, if you see a uh, white circle go off, that is a player or a tripod taking a picture. So players have individual handheld cameras that they can use to take pictures of birds. Uh, but they can also work together to put down a tripod, which stands, uh, doesn't move, uh, and will um, take pictures of birds uh, flying by it. It has a recharge so that it doesn't just rapid fire um, get all the pictures of all the birds necessarily, but it really does help um, get all these birds flying past. Um, and you can also see it's uh, maybe a little hard to tell on here, but above the birds, there are some little yellow dots. Um, it's clear when you're actually playing the game in full screen mode, but that is the number of photographs you need to take of that bird before you get paid for your set of photographs per se. So after you finish taking pictures of bird, a bird, uh, you get money. Uh, the other way to earn money is by finding gold. And you do that by breaking rocks, um, which sometimes have gold under them. And you can do that with a uh, pickaxe. Every player has um, uh, their own pickaxe. Uh, but there's also dynamite that you can buy that um, uh, gets rid of several rocks at the same time. So it's more effective, but it has a price to it. Uh, and so those are generally, there's three people at once, all trying to make as much money through these two broad strategies. Um, so uh, to study teams, I mean, teams uh, at their very basic components, uh, they're multiple people, uh, but quintessentially these people are interdependent. They're working together. Um, and I really like uh, Courtright et al.'s typology um, where uh, they go over how teams can be made interdependent by having shared inputs, um, by the nature of their workflow, how they actually have to work together, and then by the goals that they share um, and the rewards that those goals uh, give them. Uh, in the this game, in Birdwatch, those are sort of um, tied together. Outcomes have value. Um, but here is how I forced interdependence according to these three uh, components. So the first, is shared inputs. And the first shared input, of course, is just the environment. They're all in the same place. They're not all in different locations. They, The rock that is right above uh, that blue guy right now is the same rock that was next to the red guy. Um, they all have the same things in their physical environment. Uh, so that includes everything in the map. That is the map. Uh, as well as the time, of course, um, they all have the same amount of time uh, to complete the task. Once the time runs out, no one can continue. Um, and resources, which in this case, uh, they mostly or they share money, uh, which is indicated here. So the team has a single pool of money. So 
when anyone wants to uh, buy or um, perform an action that costs money, such as uh, this dynamite or placing a uh, camera, uh, that's going to draw from the same pool. So if multiple people are um, drawing from that pool, someone might not be able to do what they want. Um, these same shared inputs also uh, essentially function as, a, as the shared outcomes because uh, they are also involved in um, rewards and whatnot. Um, first thing again is the map um, that every time uh, a player breaks a rock, you know, that's the outcome of their mining or that dynamite action you just saw. Um, the outcome is the breaking the rock. That rock is broken for everybody. And um, in this mini map here at the top, this is a, um, uh, because the player can only see so much of the map at a time, uh, we have the entire map uh, game world represented up here uh, in this mini map. And whenever uh, a player um, uncovers this black stuff is called fog of war. So you can see this red person is moving down and uncovering more of the map. When that one person does that, everyone's minimap updates. So they have information about, uh, they all get the same information when one person explores more of the map. Um, of course, time, uh, not really outcome per se, still shared, uh, but then their money, uh, as I was sort of uh, mentioning before, uh, that um, you know, when people use money, it goes down, but when people get money, so this person's about to pick up some gold, that money goes to the team. Um, so they all share the um, money that they get. Uh, the last part is the uh, interdependence of workflow. And so I've blown up this uh, map, or, sorry, this uh, menu on this right-hand side, just to make it uh, a little clearer. Uh, so the way that this game forces interdependence and workflow is how you decide to attack the map, basically. Um, do you split up so that everybody fans out and explores and does their own thing? Um, or does everybody stay together and really drive down towards like the bottom right corner of the map? Um, or is there some combination? You know, how do you assign uh, areas? Um, the other part is specialization. Um, who does which actions? Uh, so the specific actions, um, I sort of did go over these before, but um, you can mine rocks, uh, you can take photos, uh, and then you can request a camera be placed. This is the start to the placing of a camera. Uh, so you can request as many cameras as you want, uh, but uh, even though it costs $10, nothing will happen. You'll just be spending $10 unless someone goes right next to the other player, like this blue player is doing, and they're tri both trying to signal they want a camera be placed. Uh, eventually, um, you saw that the um, red player uh, requested the camera that the blue player then accepted right next to them and the camera was placed. Um, and so those are two separate actions uh, sort of come together into uh, two halves of one action. And the last one is the dynamite, uh, which you again just saw that blue player um, use. Um, what I was talking about with the money um, gets to this sort of facilitation obstruction, uh, where if you're spending money on dynamite, you might not have enough money to build the uh, camera that someone else wants to build. Um, if you don't, uh, but you can also break rocks and find new bird paths. Uh, so that someone else can take pictures. So there are multiple ways in which one player's actions can obstruct or facilitate uh, what another player is doing. Uh, and the last sort of um, more, mo maybe most classical definition of coordination is uh, synchrony or sequence, uh, which is built in to this placing the camera action because it requires co-location and a specific action being performed by one person and a separate button being pressed by a different person. Uh, so that is how um, this game works to force people to act as teams. Um, but this um, bird watch, I'm sorry about that, um, is also a very powerful tool for gathering data, uh, measuring uh, multiple types of 
behaviors as well as outcomes. Um, so the first, um, uh, well, also before I um, get to the data it collects, um, I want to say that uh, the sort of uh, inspiration behind exactly how this log data um, was set up was when I first came to grad school, uh, I joined this ongoing project looking at how uh, leadership training impacted emergency room medical team outcomes. Um, and so they had uh, some papers on that. And when I was brought in, we wanted to recode uh, those videos uh, for team behaviors. Uh, so I began looking, uh, doing a lit review of uh, team behavioral coding schemes. Um, the videos uh, looked actually a lot like this picture, except the camera was farther away and the footage was far blurrier. Um, uh, so we didn't actually, uh, it would have been incredibly intense uh, to uh, behaviorally code uh, team behaviors. So every person's behaviors for these, uh, uh, I think it was about 100, it was at least uh, 30, 50 something videos uh, that could be up to an hour plus long. Um, so we ended up publishing this paper that I cited down here. Uh, on qualitative data, uh, qualitative data, uh, but uh, nonetheless, uh, that looking for uh, behavioral coding schemes uh, exposed me to the pros and cons of different ones. Uh, the one I really liked uh, was Tempo, um, which I liked it because it had so many aspects to it, but it was really not practical because there it's a lot of data that it captures, which makes it a good coding scheme, but really intensive for trainers. Uh, to uh, teach raiders how to use and then for raiders to uh, use adequately. Uh, but I still use the tenets of this in how I structured my log data. So the first uh, aspect of this um, system is that it needs to track time. Um, it needs to track people, uh, all the people who are doing different behaviors over time. Of course, it needs to denote what those behaviors actually are. Um, and because this is a team behavior coding system, we actually want all the actions that could be very different across people happening simultaneously to all be recorded. Um, and we also want to make sure that the outcome, the reason these behaviors are done, the objective of them is clear in the coding scheme. Uh, and then, of course, the more types of teams and tasks your coding system uh, applies to, the better. Uh, so here are um, these um, six uh, tenants uh, listed out ver uh, horizontally now. And um, below is a picture of what the data looks like when uh, I just um, birdwatch outputs a CSV file. I open it in Excel, um, color it a little bit, and it looks like something like this. Uh, so uh, I'm just going to go through how each of these things are represented uh, here. Of course, time, there's a timestamp for every action uh, and location. So we actually know uh, when and where everything is happening. Uh, the source of the action is the player uh, in the player column. And the content is the action. So whether they're taking a photograph or mining uh, and it gets all actions at every time point. So at the 16th second, um, someone took a photo of a bird, uh, but someone else was mining and we got both of those data points. Um, the relationship to the outcome, uh, namely the score in this case, is the value. So um, when uh, this player three took a photo of uh, this bird and this first number here denotes the species, uh, we have several different types and colors of birds. Uh, this particular species uh, photographs are worth $70. Uh, and so that um, gets added to the previous $70 in this other column, uh, which I'll actually mention in a second. I want to go back to uh, how this actually has the potential to include way more uh, types of data, uh, such as potentially even network data where people are acting towards each other. Uh, giving each other boosts, penalizing each other, such like that. 
So we have recipients uh, of actions in the subject column. In this, per, in this case, um, the bird received uh, a photograph from the player. The player took a picture of the bird. Uh, and then we also have goal progress. So we can actually also not just track behaviors, but how outcomes accrue over time. And the flexibility here is just the way that Marson developed this. Um, it is uh, not too much extra work to add extra scores, uh, ex their, um, other actions, uh, other things to track. Um, so this can be applied to multiple teams and task types. The other way we gather data through this is uh, through an embedded link in the game over screen. So as soon as the game is finished, uh, players are directed to a survey to complete measures, uh, something, some things that you would have to self-report, um, like how you feel towards your teammates, cohesion, um, even affect or mood. Um, that would all be can be collected and will be collected after, but through this separate survey. Um, and that uh, is how we've been collecting data uh, for the example studies I'll uh, get to after this last part of the overview, which is this recruiting component. Uh, so this study is really um, easy to participate and to administer. Um, it really is uh, this game Marson built is being hosted on this website. All you have to do is go to that URL. Uh, you don't have to download a client or anything. You just hit that run game button and you're playing. I'll show you what that looks like uh, in a second. Um, but I thought I'd also offer um, what we've been using to uh, sort of get people in. Um, and we wanted some more experimental control. Uh, there's you know um, options for less control if you want people just coming in and maybe filling out a two question survey. We have longer surveys, uh, so we want to make sure people are in there uh, and committed and they're not going to bail on their teammates. Uh, so what we have them do is join a Zoom webinar, just like this one, uh, where um, participants can only chat with the experimenter and they don't have audio or vis uh, video. So it's um, completely anonymous uh, to each other. Uh, and we wanted to do this uh, because um, basically keeping uh, judgments pure to the task. So, you know, you could have people turn uh, video and audio on, but we didn't want personal physical attributes to uh, confound any judgments. Uh, then there is just a little text file on a Google Drive that we um, edit to create a game room um, with a player name and a unique code for that player. Um, and so we direct them to the website we give them that code and the URL to get there, and they arrive at this page. And um, I'm just going to uh, sort of voice over this video. Uh, I just recorded uh, what happens when I uh, start. So we're on the page. Uh, the Run button was clicked. Game is loading. Welcome screen appears. Make sure people know where the full screen icon is. Code gets typed in. That went a little bit fast, but they hit join game. It counts down. And this is where the video ends, but they would be dropped right into the game world and start playing. Um, and so the final part, it's online, it's easy, but people also really like um, playing this uh, game. Uh, uh, there's a, a, a question in the survey that lets people leave a comment. Uh, this is pretty part of the course, uh, people usually say something nice or not at all, or there's like, oh, this could be, this one thing could be better. Um, but some of my uh, favorite quotes, uh, like this one, I had a lot of fun, double exclamation mark. It was a nice collaborative effort and it's the most fun I've had participating in, experiment, in an experiment. Uh, I think the bird pun names are great too. And I do as well, that's why I made them. Uh, and then this other one, made me think of um, some real possibilities. If there were better graphics uh, and the game was a little more complex in design, I'm sure many people would play this game to kill time. Perhaps it would not be a trendy game, but an underrated game to have in my library. Uh, so this person 
would like to have just access to the to this game to play on their own. You couple that with a few survey questions, we could have potential uh, to collect data from a huge number of people. Uh, and also this, uh, I wish the graphics were better, was actually not something a lot of people said. A lot of people actually said stuff like the animations were cute or like they liked the 2D uh, sort of classic retro feel to it. Um, but so those are the three major advantages of um, this uh, platform, this measurement tool. Uh, so now I'm going to talk a bit about um, two, the two studies we have that are uh, currently using this. Um, I'm going to go over the studies in very broad strokes just to sort of give a primer of the topics you can look at uh, and how um, you can look at some of this stuff. Uh, so starting with this uh, study on uh, how culture impacts team processes. Um, I had started designing this for my thesis way back in uh, 2019, um, but I have a, a um, friend and uh, colleague who works with uh, Michelle Gelfand, uh, who is now over at the Stanford Business School. Um, and um, with some help from a Navy grant, um, we uh, finished uh, developing this, uh, this game to use in both uh, a study for her uh, research um, uh, project as well as uh, my own study, uh, which I'll go over next. Uh, but so this study, uh, the research question generally was, how does organizational culture affect how teams approach tasks and to adapt to changes in their environment? Um, and so overall, the procedure, uh, they got a vignette that contextualized the organizational context, gave the values, a little bit of a backstory, um, so that when they went into the game, they would probably play one way or another. I'll mention the um, exact ways of playing that we looked at uh, when I get to the uh, variables and measures. Uh, and then they get directed to a follow-up survey uh, where asked about cohesion, uh, potency, other things, uh, potential moderators, mediators, uh, things like that. But so the variables and their main, main models uh, we're looking at how culture impacts adaptation, and the processes we specifically looked at um, are exploration and exploitation. Exploration just meaning behaviors that uh, seek to un uh, uncover novelty, come to creative solutions. Um, uh, Risk-taking is often part of exploration, whereas exploitation is much more about immediate gain, uh, very simple things that are easy to execute, especially in coordination with other people, um, to really get all the value they can from a specific income source. Um, so we measured this um, with the um, actual actions that people could use. Um, but I'll, I'll start at the, the top of the model uh, where culture was, of course, um, introduced in the primes. Um, and adaptation was actually introduced uh, as a um, shift during the game. The game would pause. Uh, they would get a message that says um, there has been uh, an extreme weather event. Uh, birds who had previously been flying in regular paths, um, very predictable, just the same uh, flight pattern, migration pattern, um, all changed. And um, they were knocked off course. The rocks and gold, there have been mudslides, and so they have moved around. And so they have to adjust to a new game map. Um, and then the uh, exploration. Uh, we coded uh, mining and using dynamite, these actions that removed obstacles so that they could go, go farther out um, because there's no guarantee that there's more birds farther out. Uh, gold is distributed randomly under rocks, so mining rocks has no guarantee of reward. Um, so that really lines up nicely with exploration. And exploitation, um, because those birds followed consistent, the same flight path through the whole game, uh, until the adaptation at least, um, taking photos and especially placing a static camera that doesn't move um, 
that can only take pictures of birds that fly past it, uh, mapped on very well to exploitation or exploitive um, team processes. So that is a very uh, broad overview of uh, this study. Um, I'm going to move on uh, to my um, study on team cognition, which started as my thesis, has become sort of a uh, research agenda, and is now uh, my dissertation, which I'm currently running. Um, so uh, just a, a little bit of background where this uh, study came from. Uh, I became interested in team cognition. Uh, my advisor has uh, written a bit on the subject, um, and I found this idea of compatibility in team cognition uh, really interesting, as opposed to uh, overlapping knowledge or similarity, which the theory of shared mental models uh, holds that the more knowledge people have in common, the easier they can predict what each other will do and coordinate better, thus perform better. Uh, but the theory of transactive uh, memory systems uh, says that there's actually a benefit from people not having the same knowledge but actually having different expertise that they then can combine to tackle more complex problems. Um, but so if having overlapping knowledge or similar knowledge is good and having different distributed knowledge is good, uh, when are they, when is one better than the other? Are they both good? Um, are there particular circumstances? Does it matter the knowledge? This is what draw, drew my attention to uh, compatibility. Um, which I'll explain uh, a bit more uh, how I looked at that uh, when I get down to the next slide in my uh, procedure and uh, variables and measures. Uh, but so my broad research question uh, was how does compatibility, as opposed to similarity specifically, um, predict the classical outcomes of coordination and uh, performance? Um, and so I'd be uh, happy to talk about uh, my study uh, more, uh, of course, but I uh, am going to um, uh, keep uh, just starting with the procedure. Um, I started by, as opposed to giving them vignettes per se, I gave them different uh, task instructions. Uh, so uh, of course, uh, and these task instructions varied by how I uh, gave them goals. Basically, the uh, summary of my uh, theoretical framework is that goals lead people to behave in certain ways that um, uh, it, it's the not, uh, you don't have to have the same goals necessarily, but the distribution of goals across the entire team leads people to behave in ways that can be more or less effective. Uh, and so the uh, mental model structure would be uh, defined as compatibility when it leads to that. So I have three goals of um, making money, which you already saw, but I also told them to find, uh, take pictures of all the unique bird species. So like one of each at least. Um, and then I give them the explicit goal to explore the whole map. Um, and so across conditions, um, I varied, um, well, the first one is sort of the control where I gave them all three goals and said they're all equally important. Go do them. Uh, the next ones, uh, or the next uh, condition, I gave them all three goals, but I told each person that one goal was more important than the other two. Uh, so that one goal uh, was always, uh, one person had the most important goal. Every goal was important to one person. Um, then, uh, condition three, I had uh, I um, gave people only two out of three goals so that every goal was represented twice across the three people, uh, and they were equally important. The last condition, I gave them only two goals, so each goal was represented twice across people, but everyone thought one goal was more important than the other goal, and that varied across people as well. Um, but so those were the instructions people got. They then started playing the game uh, and then completed a survey where um, uh, we asked some follow-up questions, uh, which I'll get to as soon as I explain my variables uh, and measures. So again, very simple. Um, it's compatibility. I call this um, goal sort of representation of the game, a team task representation. 
Uh, but so it's mental model or uh, mental representation compatibility influences coordination and uh, performance through coordination. Uh, and of course, performance is performance on these three goals. Um, and this is all three goals for all teams uh, because all three goals do exist at the team level. Everyone's aware of at least one goal is important to the team. Uh, so how did I measure this? Uh, well, the team task, uh, the representation, I basically had them report their mental models in the survey afterwards. Uh, coordination, um, the camera was the coordinating behavior. Uh, there were other ways you can coordinate, but if uh, someone places successfully a tower or two people work together to place a tower uh, as a camera tower, uh, a motion detecting camera, uh, then clearly they coordinated successfully. Uh, I also looked at coordination. I had a, a self-report measure just because I do have a novel framework and I wanted to use multiple uh, measurement techniques. Uh, finally, performance was <laughs> operationalized as uh, progress on these three goals. Uh, and so um, creating these uh, team tasks, uh, the compatibility measurements was complicated, but otherwise fairly simple, but very detailed behavioral data going into it. Uh, so now um, I want to uh, talk about uh, just a few other things that we built uh, into the game uh, that are there to use. Um, and then after that, uh, going to human AI teaming, uh, because that's a possibility here, uh, but it's not set up for that so far. So the other functionalities, um, there's a very easy possibility to um, look at these uh, variables from these studies I mentioned and other variables, how they um, affect different team uh, structures, such as size. Um, I wanted three players because um, there's some more complexity that emerges uh, when you have more than just a dyad, but I didn't want uh, too many people because having three people sign up for a study at the same time uh, and not having two people unable to participate because there was a no-show, it's already a big enough problem, uh, but the game will afford uh, larger teams. Uh, there's also, I didn't do this, uh, actually. I told people that actions... Um, the actions players can take might vary, uh, but um, there's actually a way to code um, in the game. Marcy made it super easy. I can do this um, by just uh, adding um, like a semicolon to that um, room player name and code uh, little image that I showed you. And that will denote what actions people can actually access. So we can um, uh, decide how specialized each person is. And of course, the uh, team context uh, that they're operating in can be um, uh, manipulated in this framework, uh, not only with primes such as um, organizational context vignettes, um, but the game world itself is very malleable. Um, Marcin also, um, thanks to him again, I'm gonna acknowledge him, but seriously, a tremendous, uh, help uh, kind of done this without him, uh, all of this. I uh, and my RAs made this map by placing rocks, uh, drawing out bird patterns, uh, assigning speeds to birds, um, how many pictures you need to take before you're rewarded. Um, all those things could be manipulated uh, for things like complexity, difficulty, other aspects of the task environment, uh, including goals. So um, I wanted to keep, uh, again, a uh, fairly new uh, theoretical framework. I wanted to keep them as just maximizing goals. Uh, they will hit a cap if they do explore the whole map, but basically more exploring is better, more money is better, uh, more unique birds better. Um, but there are definitely some very interesting dynamics that can happen when you have optimizing goals. Uh, and so you don't want to go past a certain point. So if two people are working towards the same goals and different parts or the same goal in different parts of the map, um, they're more likely to go past it. Then one person tries to diminish that back to the um, optimum. The other person might be doing the same and they might go past it. Uh, very interesting dynamics to look at there. Uh, and of course, coordination or um, cooperation versus competition uh, we can introduce individualized scores uh, as well as that team uh, score of money. Um, 
And finally, uh, it's not actually in this version anymore, but in an alpha version, we actually had a chat box. Marcin built it, so um, you hit enter and you can start typing and it'll pop up right in the bottom right hand corner. So people can actually, you can actually communicate. Uh, we stripped this out because we wanted to reduce some complexity uh, to really focus in on some of these mechanisms because um, communication underlies a lot of um, different processes. It makes teamwork a lot easier. Uh, we re reduced that back to the signal, this little bubble that pops up that indicates a player wants to put down a camera. But it's chat, people are interested in that. Can we put back in? Uh, it would have printed the chat to the log file. So we know when people said what, so we can track conversations over time. Very cool possibilities with that. Uh, and really, if you can dream it and Marson can build it, it'll work. Uh, we've talked about many more extensions already, uh, but again, it's um, we kept it simple for these research questions, uh, but there's just so much more we can do including building in human AI teaming into this game. Uh, so just like video games in uh, psychological research on organizational work teams, uh, it's not new to use video games. Um, it's not um, new in uh, or using human AI teams. It's not new to video games either. This is um, one of my favorite games from when I was a kid or honestly, probably still one of my top two or three, if not my top, Super Smash Bros. Melee, if anyone knows it, basically you can play as any Nintendo character or many Nintendo characters, whoops. Um, and the goal is basically to knock people off of a stage. Uh, as they you hit them, they get more damage and they fly further. Um, and you can play one-on-one -on -one or just have a bunch of people, uh, four different people playing at once, but there's also a team setting. And so uh, this person, this is just a screenshot from online that I took, um, but you can see there's a blue, green, and red team. Uh, the blue and green are computer players, um, but on the red team, we have a human controlling Kirby here and uh, working together on the same team with these ice climbers controlled by the computer. So this is a human AI team. I was using human AI teams back back in 2003, whatever uh, this was sometime around then. Um, but um, Melee, great game. Uh, how does this relate back to Birdwatch? Well, um, we can ask the research question. Uh, this is something that uh, we've talked about. I know there's been a lot of research uh, on this already, but it's a great example of uh, when do team members trust AI more or less? Does it depend on uh, reciprocity or predictability? Stuff that the literature says um, underlie human forming uh, of trust relationships. So what does this look like in Birdwatch? This question mark is supposed to pop up in a second. Uh, but what does it look like? Well, predictability, um, we could look at with uh, in this scenario, let's say um, the human is uh, in yellow and the AI is in red. Um, the human wants to build a camera. When they ask for a camera to be built, does the AI respond? Uh, do they actually go and help them or do they continue with their own priorities, which might be mining rocks or m exploring the map, moving away? Um, Reciprocity, we could look at the log data. Oh, and, and we can also look at log data for predictability to see whether or not the action followed. Um, and then we can also follow up in a survey and ask people how predictably did this AI act. For reciprocity, we can imagine, oops, I hate this mouse, just spoiling all my uh, grand entrances. Um, in this uh, uh, version of the log data that I've sort of replicated, uh, we have at time one, the AI requests a player to help them. Um, at time two, the player says, okay, and goes over, helps that um, AI put down a camera. Uh, and then time three, player one is like, yeah, we should, we should build another camera. Um, I helped you, can you help me build another one? 
what does the AI do? Um, does trust depend on whether they resist, uh, assist again? Or maybe as long as they're doing something else that's valuable, is that going to uh, increase trust? So that reciprocity doesn't actually have as much of an effect as we thought. We can track all this stuff through um, the log data we collect and certainly uh, with supplemental surveying. Um, and really, uh, now when I try and move on, the possibilities uh, are endless. Um, I, uh, looking forward to this talk because it's been a lot of work that a lot of us have been putting into this, uh, but there's so many other research questions I'm very interested in, uh, and I would love for this tool to be used by other people. Um, so if you would like to use this tool, uh, collaborate, uh, any of those things, I definitely uh, would like to extend that invitation. Um, and finally, uh, just acknowledge uh, some of the key players here. Um, again, Marcin, thank you so much for everything uh, you've done. And he was nice enough to uh, leave his email uh, here in case you have more technical questions for him. You can reach out to him directly. Um, my brother for helping me really get started with games um, and some of my other collaborators here. And again, my email uh, down here at the bottom right. Um, but otherwise, that's it uh, for me. And I just want to thank you guys all so much for uh, listening. Um, and I can see my video lagging, so putting up with that, um, uh, it's been a pleasure to talk to you all. Uh, so now I believe, um, on to questions. Hi, I'll go ahead and field the first question, but then I'm going to hand it over to Paris because I have a one o'clock meeting I have to get to, but Josh, thank you so much for this talk. I want to talk to you separately over lunch about your game and, and all the possibilities. Um, Anton Ritting asked via the Q&A, in the non-control settings, do the team members know that the other team members were getting different instructions or were they left to believe the other team members were playing the game wrongly? I left that ambiguous. Um, I, I told them that, um, I told them, please wait, uh, be patient while I send out instructions individually um, because it takes a while the way in Zoom webinar to drop a file to people, to a specific person, um, uh, takes a little bit, but I don't tell them actually what each other's instructions are. Um, and, uh, I'll also add that the conditions, I'm not actually, uh, none of my hypotheses have anything to do with the conditions. It's all about just creating variance. Um, so if someone, uh, if I told someone that one goal was important, but through playing, they decide another goal is important. That um, doesn't violate any sort of manipulation checks. Uh, that difference in thinking uh, is exactly what I'm interested in. Um, and so if they, whether or not they uh, knew that other people had the same instructions, um, they could also change. And I, looking through the data just preliminarily, people do come up with some wild ideas. I don't know how um, they, uh, rate some goals so highly given the instructions they got. Uh, but luckily that doesn't affect my, uh, 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 like word validity, validity of my inferences. Uh, but yeah, great question. Uh, thanks. Great. We're More open questions. to any other questions. About what this can be used for, how it can be used. Um, can it be used for your specific research question? Um, love to talk about any of that. Well, I for one definitely want to say that I would easily play this game in my free time. <laughs> I thought it was so fun. I think that's incredibly validating to hear. Um, yeah, always love to uh, hear that it's fun in addition to good for research. And we are almost at time. Um, so uh, if uh, I again want to mention, if anyone wants to reach out uh, and connect afterwards, more than happy to do that. Uh, send the slides out at some point as well. Um, but do you see another question? Yes, we do have one from Noel. What teaming or teamship attributes can you abstract out of this? Teaming or teamship attributes. Um, 
I've been in the uh, process uh, aspect so long. I've been focusing on actions. Could you clarify a little bit um, what you mean by um, uh, especially teamship? Like, is that more process or? Teamship is the ultimate in teams. So deep connections. Yeah. Um, uh, so um, some of the questions uh, I, I have a lot of extra questions uh, in my survey because I just think there's such a rich uh, data opportunity. Um, but we asked them um, about stuff like continuance, commitment, uh, would um, cohesion. Would you, um, you know, hang out with these people based on how much you know about them, um, how connected you feel, and so that kind of thing can absolutely be um, asked directly in a follow-up survey. Um, but I also think that the interdependence, if you see two people co-located all the time, um, if you see them uh, doing the same things or responding to each other, um, I think there are a lot of ways you could code that uh, behaviorally um, as well. And I think that brings us to time. So I do want to thank everyone again for coming out and listening to our wonderful Josh. And um, please check out our website. So that would be otters.ischool.umd.edu. And we have a bunch of speakers lined up. And our next speaker will be Nancy Cook on May 17th. And that will be about interactive team cognition for humans and machines. Thank you all for coming. Have a good spring break.